My name is Christine Hartline, and I'm the director of the Animal Safe House program at the Rancho Coastal Humane Society. The whole program really started with um, the fact that we were receiving so many calls from domestic violence shelters. And these shelters were really kind of basically desperate to find um, a place for people to put their animals. Santa! Hi, honey! I think, you know, it really uh, eases an, an enormous burden for them because, um, it, as I mentioned, so many of them really feel like they ha they're stuck, that they can't leave, you know, that situation unless they know their pet's safe. So once they know that, and once they know that their pet's going to be well taken care of, then there's an enormous sense of relief on that part, and they can kind of move on. People who are, are suffering and going through this whole situation, I think, just have that unconditional love, that 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 kind of interesting support that an animal gives, um, really helps them tremendously. And and that's yeah, that's really rewarding for me to see. It's very very rewarding for me because I you know I love working with animals, I love working with people, and I think um, it's such an important topic. And really, you know, as a society, uh, how we treat animals really does, I think, um, demonstrate ver something very important about what values our society has. Because violence is violence, whether it's violence towards animals or violence towards humans. Oh my goodness, yes, you just need to love you up. Huh. Sometimes I, I wonder what people think, like, oh, well, you know, you're sort of like helping out animals, big deal. But I think, you know, given what we know about domestic violence and given that we know that um, abusers threaten, hurt, and kill animals. And given that we know people don't leave because of that, you know, uh, people are willing to sacrifice their lives to just so they know their animals are safe. When I heard about this, this whole kind of you know citizens of courage thing, I was like, wow, that's totally should not go to me. I mean, I was thinking, you know, really, um, you know. As I mentioned, the real, I think the real people with the amazing amount of courage are the people that really, you know, decide to get out of this situation. Ron Allen, and I'm 39. I'd gotten off work early. Um, I was up in Linda Vista picking up some lunch, headed home and saw two teenagers look like, on the sidewalk look like they were getting ready to fight near the intersection. Once they did start fighting, the car in front of me, three or four other kids, possibly young adults, also jumped out, and it was quickly four on one, in which case I mainly jumped out of my own car and jumped in to try to break it up. Probably two or three punches each, and then they were grappling and they're all hitting and punching one kid, kicking, stomping on him. After I got knocked down, got back up, I kind of pushed my way in and stood over him, because he, he was pretty much out of it. I couldn't tell if he was completely unconscious or just stunned. The others rushed off. I stayed there in case they came back. It bothered me when I did see the photographs at the trial. They showed me the photographs in the hospital. And I really felt bad about that, wishing maybe jumped in a few seconds sooner or something like that. Um, but if I had not, definitely serious to permanent injury. Because one of them was, in my opinion, was trying to possibly kill him. Yeah, called me on the phone about this. I almost freaked out all over again because <laughs> it just didn't seem that unusual to me. I'm not going to turn my back, walk away, pretend I'm not involved. Yes, <laughs> especially my mother. Her wor words were, "We're very proud of you. Now don't you do it again." My name is Joe Hake, and I'm 22 years old. As I got close to the market, 
There was a woman on the street about 18, 19 years old, and she was crying hysterical, very distraught. And so I cautiously approached her, and she, when I got closer, she asked if she could use my cell phone. So I gave her my phone without asking any questions. I mean, she was not in good shape, and this guy was crazy. She said she had been thrown on the ground by her boyfriend, and she tried to get up, and he threw her back down and spit in her face. And then he took her cell phone and threw it into the ocean. So I get my phone back, and next thing I know, this guy pushed me up against this brick wall outside this market. And I, I put my arms out kind of like, you know, like, what are you doing? I'm just helping your girlfriend. So he pushed me up against the wall, and then he hit me right inside of the face. I woke up, and uh, blood coming out of, like my nose and mouth. and. Barely, like, I had, didn't even realize what had happened at that time. And, uh, I woke up, and sure enough, both of them were gone. I suffered a concussion, a uh, fractured eye socket, and a broken nose. They both took off. I'm sure his mindset was, he hit me, he's going to get away scot-free, and that didn't happen. He, you can't go around hitting people like that when they're not doing anything wrong. I testified in the preliminary hearing, which was about two months afterwards in April, and then about a year later was the actual trial, and I testified again. If that hadn't happened, she could have still continued to date that guy, and she could be, you know, she could be dead in three months if he's acting like that. I consider myself lucky, actually, because if I would have gotten hit probably an inch higher or an inch lower, I mean, I could be blind in my left eye or I'd have fake teeth, so, I don't know. I always think it could have been worse, and if I could go back, I'd, I mean, I'd help her again. Or, you know, I do the same thing in the same situation. Uh, my name is uh, Julian Cristo Lucero, and I'm uh, 26 years old. In uh, March of 2007, me and a couple of friends were hanging out at Effin's Pub in the college area. Oh, she was terrified. She had like bruises on her arms that she was hiding, you know, wearing a long sleeve shirt, but. I guess uh, her friend had, was telling us that she gets beaten by her ex-boyfriend a lot. And when he showed up, he started uh, you know, a big ruckus between them, arguing outside, this, that, and the other. She was terrified, you know. She said, she kept on telling us, you know, he's in a, well, telling them that he was in a beater, he's in a beater, he's in a beater, and this, that, and the other. You know, I felt as a, you know, as a, my responsibility to step in. You know, I don't like people hurting women. You know, I stepped in and the, the guy confronted me. I confronted him back. We had a little altercation. It started, it ended with us exchanging words. You know, he told me he was gonna kill me. He's gonna come back and kill me, get me, and go get his gun, his heat. At that moment, you know, we grabbed, we got her, uh, the girl Janice, and we all left. I looked over, I saw him. He was like in this motion, pulling out his gun. I told my girl, go, he's got a gun. He shot like three times at our car. He put like one bullet hole in our car. It went right through the right through the door and got stuck in my passenger seat. So he missed me by about, uh, the district attorney, attorney told me he missed me by about an inch. I, I couldn't believe it. It was over. You know, he never even met me. He didn't even know who I was. And we had to testify against him in court. I was in Iraq. He was in the Persian Gulf at the time. And I flew out of Dubai straight here to come to San Diego to testify at trial. I obviously thought I was doing the right thing. Um, come to find out after it was all said and done, Janice was uh, denying that she asked us for help. But I guess it's a battered woman syndrome. When their help is available, they always want it, ask for it. But when they realize that there's no longer help available, they just go back to the old way, I guess. I do feel like I did the right thing. And if someone's in trouble, you know, you got to step up and do what you got to do. My name is Abraham Macias, and I'm 20 years old. It was my little sister's uh, birthday party. She was turned 15 uh, that day. And at the house, we had a little uh, party for her. When I walked outside, I saw a couple of gangster-looking uh, kids that were pretty much older than the average guest there. I knew right away that they, they weren't supposed to be there. I mean, just from the age. 
kept walking towards the house. Um, that's when he saw my, my rosary that I had on that my father gave me for Christmas. I was wearing it at the time and uh, he saw it on me and that's when he uh, told me, hey, hand over your chain. He then pulled out a gun and put it on the side of my head at this moment. I, I kind of looked over and I saw a, a gun and I felt the cold of the, the cylinder right on, on the side of my head. And at that moment, I, I saw you know, my life flash in front of my eyes. I kind of thought, what should I do now? And I said, well, if, if I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down in style. And I'm not going to just sit around and wait to, to die. I knew it was a, a, a revolver, and I knew that if you hold the cylinder of the gun, the gun will not go off. So that's exactly what I did. I, I grabbed the, the hold of the gun, and we were fighting for the gun. That's when the first guy that, that was in the incident jumped on me and started hitting me all over my face and, and, uh, and my body. Then the other guy was hitting me. I, I, I saw the tooth fly out of my, out of my mouth, and that's when I, I let the gun go. I was like, well, you know what? I, I, I did the best I could. Now let's get everybody into the house. So I was running into the party. I, I was waiting for the, the gun to go off because that was my main concern. I was running away. I was counting the seconds that the gun was going to go off and how many gunshots were going to go off. I strongly believe things happen for a reason. Um, and that was pretty much kind of like a situation to go, are, are you ready for, to become police officer? Are you ready for the challenge? Because as a, as a police officer, you're going to run into these things you know, day and night, whether you're off duty, on duty. People recognize you, they'll recognize you down in the streets. And are you going to be mentally prepared, primarily mentally prepared to, to go on? And after the incident, are you going to be prepared to, to deal w with, the, uh, with the trauma? My name is Charles Wright. I'm 31 years old. I'm doing like 70, 75, and the car passes me, and my car starts to shake as if I was sitting still. I'm like, wow, he, he must be moving. First thing I did, I looked up because I'm thinking maybe it's a high speed chase. I seen he. His, um, I would say his, it was his passenger side, had sideswiped the driver's side of another car. When he sideswiped the guy, when his car flipped about four times, his car was laying in the middle of the interstate. It was, I mean, in the freeway, it was laying at an angle, and like, I'd say two, maybe three lanes were being covered. So in order to prevent things from getting worse, other people not seeing, you know, or seeing it at the last minute, I was just like, okay, well, I mean, if anything, they'll hit my car and then, you know, that will cause them to stop vices, them running into this situation, making it worse. First thing I did, I jumped out of the car. I went over to the guy who was laying. He was hanging out of the car. His upper body was hanging out. You can see where his seat belt was on. Had it not been on, he... The guys that hit him, I told them, I was screaming at them, hey, call for help, call for help. And they were like, no, nah, um, did you see what happened? We'll talk about that later, call for help. So I immediately I started, I started CPR on the guy. And I looked like these guys still won't call for help. I was getting mad. I was getting mad because I'm like, you guys, I'm thinking to myself, you're trying to course me to lie. I don't know the outcome of this person, but because you guys want to go out and drink. And I guess not think about the well-being of anyone else. You go out and drink and you come down this road speeding, I mean, driving God knows how fast. You know nothing about this person. And all you're concerned about is getting yourself out of trouble. I don't care who you are, how much money you have, where you're coming from or where you're going. Drinking and driving just does not mix. I have two daughters. Oh. I have a four-year-old. Uh, her name is Talia. I have a two-year-old. Her name is Tahira. I think had I been in that situation, I would have wanted some, someone to do it for me as well. Life is too short. You never know when it's going to be your last day. So, I mean, just treasure every moment that you have here.